Saturday, the 20th of May, 2022, Scrappy Murphy's in Birmingham, 7 p.m. Be there. The Chronicles of Podcast Live. Tickets on sale now. Go to www.ctickets.com. It's about getting into schools and talking to young people because, you know, I, I know that people can change. Uh, and, it, and it's about talking to people and getting them to understand and perhaps step back from violence and, and prejudice and whatever. And we just need to work together and keep on the good fight there. Absolutely. Hey there, guys. We are ecstatically happy to announce that we are associated with the Sophie Lancaster Foundation. The times are changing and with the unfortunate death of Sophie, those changes have made a massive impact for the future. If Sophie was with us still today, I can guarantee what you are doing will still be reaching so many lives of young teenagers, young adults, and those who wish to be as different as possible. So thank you very much. To find out more about this incredible foundation and all the work they do, and more importantly, how you can help, head on over to www.sophielancasterfoundation.com. Hi, this is Steve Laporte, and be sure to watch the Chronicles of Podcasts with Tom and Jamie. Oh! Hi, guys. Oh, hang on. Wait a minute. What's well, something's wrong here? Something's really wrong with this. With it. Oh, I know what it is. There we go. Hey, it's the Chronicles of Podcast. And we're back for the 35th edition? Yeah, 35. Wow. Cool. It matches me. We're almost halfway. So uh, I believe these are the Chronicles of Stephen Laporte. They are indeed. Cool. Oscar Academy Award winner Stephen Laporte. Jamie, should we get this show on the road? Oh, I definitely think we should. Cool, because I really enjoy driving. Hit it! Jamie, I yes, sir. We should bring that piece in, don't you? Oh, we definitely should. Welcome to the Chronicles of Steve Laporte. Steve is a Oscar award-winning special effects and makeup artist in Hollywood. He started life out as a clown, though, Jamie. Yeah, that blew my mind. <laughs> he tells you all about how he became a clown and how he went to clown college, which was one of the most fascinating, but the longest answer given in the Chronicles of Podcast history. And yep. we love it, Jamie. Oh, we do. We absolutely love it. As we said, that's got to be up there with Steve Nallen and Pierre Bohanna as the longest answer to a question. It's great. Ever. So great. Uh, Steve is genuinely one of the loveliest and the most funniest people. You get to hear some stories about David Lee Roth. You get to hear <laughs> some stories about Beetlejuice about the Lost Boys, about the Goonies, about Terminator 2. There's some unbelievable movies this man has worked on. He's also been part of the Lost TV series. It's just insane. The, literally, like I said in the trailer, the man's IMDb list will take about 40 years to get through. It's so long. It really would. I remember when I found Steve's page, I was going through his IMDb, I was like, this is an incredible, no way in hell are we going to hear back from this guy, but you're damn right I'm trying. There's a contact page there. When he emailed back, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> Yeah, this is, one of those, this is one of those guests where you're like, well, damn. You yeah. Won, you've won an Oscar. That, that's yeah. huge in the entertainment business. That is massive. And you're a Beetle genuinely juice. wonderful and nice nuts. person. Yeah, it's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Uh, so we're very, very excited to release this one for you all for you to Absolutely. thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy. Absolutely. You guys are going to love this one. I know I do. Jamie! <gasps> yes, sir. Any final words just massive thank you to steve it was an absolute honor to sit down and talk to you your stories are incredible sir and we're very much excited for people to hear this steve thank you for taking the time out to talk to us we really really appreciate it ladies and gentlemen here we go ladies and gentlemen interviewing this week 
He is a special effects makeup artist in Hollywood. He also used to be a clown. It's Steve Laporta. Oh, I got my old tunes. Oh, nice. Nothing like an old Rolling Stone, Stones and Steppenwolf and Doris's. Doris nice and a head. Yeah, yeah rubber head. <laughs> something I'm making for the makeup school right now. So, oh, amazing. Just something, just something to add a little conversation if you have to talk about something and I need a prop. <laughs> I like that, though. I like that. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, so beautiful. Where'd you put it? Oh, by the way, here's a commercial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, since I'm not doing makeup anymore, I'm making this shit. So. <laughs> Um, it's pretty much a free for all, Stephen. You can say whatever you like here. We don't. I figured it was. <laughs> yeah, you can say we're all good. We're all good. And uh, okay. thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. Um, lovely. Right. So basically, what happens is Jamie is going to lure you into a false sense of security with a really nice little, lovely little introduction. introduction for you. I couldn't say the word okay. then. That will happen to me. Um, <laughs> and then basically, we're going to absolutely bombard you. The living. Sh- out of you with questions, Stephen. How does that sound? Oh man, I hey, I got a lot of crap to talk about. I'm yes. gonna run this. I'm gonna run this down. I'm not looking at that, so it all looks like as slick as you guys are. <laughs> like it, like it. Uh, there we go. That's better. There we go. Boom. That's better. Perfect. Beautiful. I like it. And this is a mic, so I guess this is where you're hearing me from. Yeah. Too. Yes. Yeah. That sounds a lot Great. clearer. Then. Beautiful. Right. Let me do my introduction. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, today we bring you a very special guest. Today's guest is a special effects makeup artist who has worked on some of Hollywood's biggest blockbusters, like Terminator 2, Lost, The Lost Boys, and the movie he won an Oscar and Saturn Award for, Beetlejuice. Everyone, I am honoured to say that these are the chronicles of Steve Laporte. Oh, God. I guess this is my 15 minutes that Andy Warhol was talking about, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, was just watching, I'm, I was just watching a documentary on Andy Warhol and said, everyone's going to be going to be famous for 15 minutes. Fortunately, I've had a lot of 15 minutes in my life. <laughs> he was referring to your time on this show. That's exactly what he was referring yeah, to. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, going through your IMDb list, I was just like, okay, oh, uh, uh, okay, we're still going. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we're, yeah, we're still going. We're definitely still, okay. I'm on in the nineties now. I'm, I'm yeah, still going. Yeah. It's still. <laughs> I know it's been a long time. It's incredible, incredible. Yeah. But we will, we'll get to that first and foremost. I want to know how your pandemic season was. So how was the last two years been for? Well, you? yeah, I, I, I tell you what, I could have chosen a better time to retire. You know, from the set, basically. Yeah, and I'm not. You know, you never re- retire completely, but keeping me home you know my wife went through a lot of issues with anxiety and depression so it was good that I stayed home my grand uh, my grandson was three my daughter's a teacher so she had to teach at home so I get to play grandpa go over with him and walk around the block 20 times with them and take them to the train station and you know it's, it's good family time for me and then fortunately I have a studio in the back of the in the back of the in the back of my property so you know I've got like a a two car garage size of a studio so i was always busting around back there and doing stuff so it kept me occupied but i'm so, so sorry it's been that. good yeah we all got our shots no one got it in this house but all my kids got it in vegas my my son and his family got it and they prevailed they just lost their taste for about six months oh Ooh. no yeah my son and he, he loves he loves barbecue and stuff so he couldn't taste anything <sighs> So I said, aren't you going to go out and have some sushi? He goes, why? I can't taste it. I'm not going to spend good money on good food if I can't taste it. Because <laughs> yeah. I bet he saved a fortune, didn't he? He's like, I'm not buying yeah, that. Can't I taste it anyway. money. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of cooking. <laughs> a, <laughs> lot of, a lot of, um, you know, at-home domestic stuff. But, you know, we live in Burbank, which is kind of a self-contained kind of nice little town away from L.A. proper. So we didn't, we don't deal with as much as the, the crazy crowds and, you know, stuff like you do it there. You know, I can walk up to the store. I can walk up to the drug store, the food store if I want. And I did a lot of walking. I rode my bike around the block a lot and a thousand times. And <laughs> so I basically yeah. got in good, good shape. Just staying home. 
fired my gardener so I could mow the yard myself. <laughs> All those childhood things you do, you know, mow the yard for a quarter, you know. So I, uh, I just turned into like, you know, Mr. Fix It around the house too. So, but it's good. We're all good now. It seemed to go that way with, with the, the lockdown and stuff like you're saying with riding your bikes. People either stayed home, ate rubbish and got fat or they were like, no, I'm going to use this time to get healthy. I'm going out, I'm going to yeah, exercise, man, got... work at the house. Absolutely. I lost 10 pounds. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. Yeah. yeah I had to, in fact, I had to hang up all my extra large shirts because I can't wear them anymore. So That's so good. It's amazing. <laughs> so yeah, My clothes don't fit anymore. <laughs> So take us back then to when you were young, young, young master Laporte. What yeah. was the original plan for you, like career was growing up? You know, what did you want to be when you were older? Was it always like movies, etc.? Or well, you know, I, I come from the Midwest, from Oklahoma, uh, which is a real conservative, you know, middle of the United States. Um, I was always a creative kid. Um, I, you know, Halloween, of course, is the, the best holiday ever. You know getting up. So I think when I was around oh, maybe seven or eight, um, I started doing stuff for Halloween, you know, stuffing clothes and making dummies to scare people. And some kid I remember on my, my block charged us a, a nickel to go into his garage and he had a little haunted house set up in there. And I thought, this is lame, I could do this. So I think around eight, eight years old, I was like making spook houses in my garage and trying to scare my neighborhood kids and stuff. And uh, so I was a creative kid. I, I drew and painted and played and built stuff. You know, I was kind of those kids who come, you know, I was born in 56. So back in those days, um, you know, I had a stepdad who was in the military and in the war and had recovery. So he built model kits to recover. And I get into to model kits when I was about seven years old. And he showed me how to paint and dry brush and do all the really detailed painting. So I was building monster models. Me a kid. I had all the old Aurora monster models. So I, I loved that. And that became a passion of mine, just being that alone time, painting and being creative and looking at the details. And I didn't know it was going to take me anywhere. Um, I think I picked up a monster, a famous monster magazine when I was maybe eight or nine. And I had a picture of a wolf man on the front of it. And, you know, my, you know, so I kind of got into the creative side of it and was always intrigued by monsters and stuff. I used to watch mystery theater on Sundays and, you know, watch King Kong and Godzilla and all those movies. So, but, you know, in Oklahoma, it's not like there's an underlining thing that says, this is a job doing makeup. You don't think of it that way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I wasn't really around theater stuff. And I think by the time I got into um, junior high school, I got into magic. So I was learning to do magic stuff and I would do birthday parties and stuff. So my, my, my gears were always turning on how do I fool people? How do I hide something? How do I manipulate something to make it look you know, believable? Um, not realizing that all that stuff is going to stick with me. And um, slowly uh, we moved away for about a year. We moved to Ohio, which is a different kind of a different, you know, different group of people, different influences so i made friends there we were only there for a year but i continued my interest in being creative and then we moved back to oklahoma different neighborhood again but again it was all you know fun at halloween and and being creative and so i was a normal kid who played with his gi joes and i didn't just play with them i sewed spider-man costumes for them i learned how to sew on a sewing machine so i still have that old gi joe with a spider-man costume on it I still I have it now yeah it's all somewhere in the up in the attic somewhere uh, That's so amazing. i took a span i had a blue spandex t-shirt and i cut it up and made the spider-man costume and my mom had these red gloves i remember cutting a piece off the red gloves and doing all the ink work on it for spider webs so yeah i was really creative you know i mean i wasn't afraid to try anything um you know, I was a normal kid. We went fishing and did camping. I was in the Boy Scouts, so I learned how to, you know, lash stuff together and make something out of nothing out in the woods and a little bit of a survival stuff, learn how to cook for myself at a young age. So I was really pretty much self-sufficient and uh, learned how to stand on my own two feet. And then I got, got into high school and really didn't find anything that interested me. I wasn't doing too well, you know, 
tried to take a, a German class, flunked that, tried to take a biology class, didn't do great in that. It was, it was interest, but the science was always kind of an interesting part. I think I just had some teachers who were challenged in passing the information along. So mm. when I eventually found a good teacher, I knew I had a good teacher, so I had someone to compare them with. So usually I would shine when I had a good teacher who knew how to relay the information and transfer it to me. And I always go back to those, those memories as I'm teaching now, or even if I'm showing someone something. There's a little something in the back of my head says, teach this person well. You know, don't, don't shortchange him on this little spot of time you have with them. Send them off with some, something that's gonna help them and help them grow either as an artist or even as a person. So didn't do, didn't do too well in first year of high school, but then there was a vocational program that came up for commercial art. And okay. you go away to a distant school on a bus for three hours a day. And it was more or less a trade school. You know, they had your, uh, you know, welding, electricians, you know, auto mechanics, um, nurses, a dental assistant, all those things. Well, I picked out commercial art. And what a luck what a lucky thing that I had because I had a teacher who had a master's degree in watercolor who taught us all about technical drawing how to do you know a portfolio and for two years I did the vocational school and I excel had one of the fastest growing portfolios of technical drawings you know we learned to work with ink washes and colored inks and acrylics line shot cameras um, I took every what's called shop class in junior high school, how to build things. I took, you know, woodworking. I took bookbinding. I took photography, all those great creative classes. And that's really what kept me afloat in school when a lot of other things are boring to kids. But I was always interested in making anything. And even that going way back when I was a kid, I saw the movie, The Absent-Minded Professor, where he created Flubber. Yes. The, the old the old black and white movie where Fred McMurray created Flubber in his laboratory. So mad scientist stuff. So I've always considered myself a bit of a mad scientist. You know, trying to take something and change it and make it better. Which, as you know, in the film industry, um, you're always growing. You're always around creative people. I think that's why it really attracted me. And I didn't really get attracted to it and later until I realized that that was a real job. I was going to be a commercial artist. You know, I did really well in high school, brought my grade point up, graduated with a really high grade point, and I got a scholarship to a continuing art school. It was a little out of town. It was still in Oklahoma, and I was going to go away and be a commercial artist and, and do stuff like that, you know. And this summer before I was supposed to go, to, go away, um, I'd come back from like a senior trip to Hawaii. My dad had on with us and I was folding up the hide a bed at my dad's house and I flipped the tent the channels on the tv set and there was a local kid show that had been on since I was a kid it was this guy dressed as a tramp clown and he had puppets and they showed cartoons and stuff and he had these two guys on there from the circus and they were clowns and I said what the heck is this I'm watching it you know and I'm thinking well, that's kind of interesting and they said well we have clown auditions at the arena tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock and I said, well, that's cool. You go in and they put a rubber nose on you and you fall down and you, you act goofy and maybe you get money, you know? And by then, you know, I was, I was graduated high school. I'd, I'd become a lot more outgoing. I'd participated in senior projects. I was in the, the cheering section for the football team. So I was really an outgoing person. I really had no, no qualms about, you know, standing up and doing something crazy. And my, my art teacher was kind of a funny guy and it rubbed off. And I come from, my dad was always funny. My mom was always funny. So I was not an inhibited kid. So I showed up at the, um, the audition and I walk in and then they hand me this application. I'm looking at it and it's for the clown school in Florida. So I sat to the audition. They pulled me out of the group and put some makeup on me. And we did some theater exercises and did a few gags and stuff, you know, with the other clowns, just to see how you could move, if you could do any pantomime, you know, say, pretend you're in a box, you know, stuff like that. And then they said, okay, does anybody, can anybody do anything? Do you have anything to offer? I said, well, I can juggle. So I juggled three balls and thought that was about it. And they said, okay, thanks everybody. Fill out your application and get it off as soon as possible. 
So they took me backstage and all the clowns who had helped with that, they ran off with their free lunch. So I'm sitting there cleaning the makeup off and this old guy comes in and he sits down and I start talking to him. As I'm talking to him, he's opening up his trunk and he's getting his stuff out and he's got a couple of dogs with him and, and we're just chit-chatting and he goes, oh, you came to audition for the clown school. I go, yeah, sure. He goes, well, it sure can be a good life. I've been doing this like 45 years now and he was just one wow. of the old timers. He starts to put his makeup on. So I'm kind of hanging back and I'm watching all the other guys come in and almost getting to be showtime. So I move from one chair to the other to get out of people's way. And I sat there and right in front of me, I saw all these guys come in and transform themselves into circus clowns. And then I sat there and watched the entire show kind of from backstage and I'd run out and peek through a curtain or whatever. So I saw, you know, the live performance aspect of what they do. It's not, you know, Ronald McDonald and Bozo the Clown. And <laughs> it's, it's really, it was really an art. It, you know, the costume changes. I saw a high stilt walker get his stilts on. I saw all the, you know, mixing soap for a pie gag, all the kind of stuff that they do. I said, well, that's really fun and creative. So I started to kind of pack it in after that show. And I happened to mention, I said, you know, my, I have a cousin who makes stilts for drywallers and painters. They're, you know, they're about three or four feet tall, but they got springs in them and you can walk on them. And I've been walking on those things since I was a kid. And the guy goes, you think you can bring a pair back and show them to us? I said, first. I called my, my cousin and he goes, well, your uncle Sam has some over at his garage. So I ran over there and I, I snuck out the back way and I came back for that next show, came back up the back way, got in without a ticket. And <laughs> hung out in the clown dressing room for another show. And by the end of that show, I had everyone walking on these stilts. And the dean of the clown college was still there. And he goes, oh, what's your name again? He goes, oh, Steve Laporte walks stilts. So I go, oh, okay, that's cool. That's great. And then one of the guys called me, he says, hey, come here. He says, if you really want to get into this, why well, have a bunch of letters, you know, bother the heck out of them, you know, you know, let them know you really want to do this. I go, okay, so I went home. I took my little commercial art training. I designed the little logo of a circus tent with clown college in it and the address and did a little logo of my name in the corner. So visually, if they got this letter, they knew who it came from. It's basically mm -hmm. my stamp and my ID on the front. So my branding was on the front of the letters. So every other day I sent a letter to them. Oh, by the way, I went to the, my local high school and took a gymnastics class you know just, <laughs> just, some, just some bullshit about what I've been practicing my handstands you know and I'm juggling with potatoes now you know, just, just goofy shit you know just tell them that I was really interested and I get a letter after about two weeks saying please don't send any more letters <laughs> enough's enough man. leave us leave us alone okay. okay I got them I got them now man so I took it I took a big sheet of shelf paper and I drew up, just wanted to let you know, <laughs> you know, I'm going to college in about two weeks. You better get on the stick here. And then I rolled it up and I sent it special delivery. And they must have called me the same day it arrived because, you know, back in those days, you know, you had the old phone on the wall. And I came home from some, somewhere one afternoon. I picked up the phone and you could, when it rings, you could tell if it was a long distance call. There was a little silent, kind of like when you get those, those crappy, phone calls on your cell phone all the time. They want to sell you something oh. and mm. you answer it and there's a long pause and then they come on Yeah, yes. and they want to do solar on your house and you don't have a house at all, <laughs> whatever. You know, it's just, there was that long pause. I go, oh, this is a long distance call. And then the guy says my name. I say, yeah. He says, and so-and-so from the clown college is, I just want to let you know you've been accepted. And I go, oh, great. I go, crap, how do I tell my folks I'm not going to college? <laughs> at least the college they think so i go oh okay so then i had to go tell my folks go, uh guess what remember that clown audition that i've been all hyped up about i got accepted so he goes, well, what are you going to do i says well i think i should take it yeah you know, maybe i could postpone the the art school for a year or so so i was basically all in so it didn't cost it didn't cost anything to get to be there you had to pay for a room and some food and but I had to get there. So I, my mom, my dad all, all supported me. I, I kind of put my little scholarship thing and it wasn't an expensive scholarship. You had to reapply, but it was, it was a step moving towards a career as an artist. So I packed everything up, you know, got 
pair of stilts. I played trumpet, so I grabbed my trumpet. I grabbed everything I thought that I could, all the tools that I needed to go there. And I jumped on a bus and took a three day long bus ride to Florida <sighs> when I was 18. Jesus. So nothing like just stepping out and just leaving, leaving home when you're 18. Um, fortunately, you know, as a young kid, I was, you know, I was a boy scout. I did camping. I, you know, was pretty self-sufficient. At least I thought I was. <laughs> and then, you know, th three days on a bus, you know, thinking about what you're going to do with your life. You know, this, this little movie plays in your head. So when I get there, it, I'm suddenly, I'm in another place where there's, a huge melting pot of people and personalities coming from all over the country. I, you know, I really hadn't been outside of my bubble for any extent of time. You know, I'd lived in whole, you know, visited California where I had some relatives. I'd been around. I wouldn't, wasn't a total shut in, but I was exposed to all kinds of people from other countries. You know, it was really a great place to see the world right now as it is. So it was like an eight week boot camp. And man, they did everything from, you know, teach you makeup, teach you how to do props, teach you how to sew with sewing machines, how to make shoes, how to make wigs, how to make rubber noses, explosives, um, comedy routines every evening, twice a week. We would watch Buster Keaton movies and Laurel and Hardy films and, and Fellini films. So I was exposed to silent films and physical comedy humor what makes something funny what makes something affect an audience you know all this stuff just crammed into your head and i excelled at everything and the thing i excelled the most at was stilt walking so by the time i left i was walking 10 foot stilts which is you know 10 foot from the foot to the ground is a long that's a long ways if you fall it's like being on the end of a stick and smacking on the ground so you don't just jump off onto the ground. You're strapped in, you're committed, and you have a long pair of pants. So you're also exposed to a lot of danger elements. And I excelled at everything. You know, my makeup looked really clean and crisp. And we had a, a makeup teacher there who was teaching us makeup. And about the second week, I noticed he was gone. And I go, what happened to the guy? And he go, oh, he got a job in Hollywood as a makeup artist. And this ah. light went on in the back of my head. Really? That's a job? Oh yeah, he got he's working up at Universal Studios and he's gonna do I go, oh okay. So I kind of just let that go and continued studying and and I did really well. My I did really good at pantomime and Pratts and Falls and you, you name it. I I ate it up. You know, there was not, you know, do clown stuff during the day and run out drinking with the boys at night. I mean, I studied everything and really excelled. And after eight weeks, I was given a contract with the show. We have a, they had a big performance they do, four hour performance and all of us, you know, we have our clown makeup on and we do all these set routines. And the bosses sit there with a big book with your picture in and out of makeup and they put little check marks by you and they, they grade you. And I got a high grade and was hired as the high stilt walker and an apprentice clown with the greatest show on earth um, wow. back in 1974. So I toured for two years on, on the Red Show, working with, man, people from Russia, Bulgaria. So it was really great because I was around all these different languages. The bad German that I did cr crappy with in high school, I, I got some books <laughs> and started studying my German again. And the, the Polish clown next to me talked German and my, the old guy over here talked German. So I kind of started learning my German. So I felt like I was in this other country but it's its own little world, you know, the circus. So, and I was one of 35 clowns in the show and I toured around and we went to hospitals. We did, you know, charity shows. I was listening to something on the radio last night. They were talking to people who'd come into the country as refugees because of all the refugee thing but between Afghanistan and Ukraine there's a lot of refugee issues around, you know, all countries mm. are bringing them in. And I remember specifically back in 74, what, it turned 75, but we actually did a, a big um, hospitality show at Camp Pendleton, the, the military base for all the Vietnam refugees. And I remember driving up and down the road where all these tents were with all the Vietnam refugees 
And I was playing trumpet calls on the trumpet, sitting in the front of a little Datsun, which was painted like a clown car. <laughs> and the clowns were hanging out. And it was like the Pied Piper. We lured all these people to the big baseball field and did this performance for all these refugees and all these kids and stuff. We gave them a piece of the circus they had never seen before. And I remember going to you know, see kids in the hospital. So you develop a lot of empathy for people. You, under, you work with people from other countries, with other beliefs. So you really become a well-rounded individual of working with different types of people and in different circumstances. And within the circus, there's a whole attitude called the show must go on no matter what. You know, the guy falls up the high wire and splats, they poof, push him out of, the, out of the way, call an ambulance in, but the show keeps going. And a couple of times I fell on the stilts smack dab in front of everybody and they just rolled me out of the way and kept the show going and hold me away you know and you develop a sense of responsibility that everything is going to keep moving so you always are responsible for your own livelihood and everyone else is around you so you really develop strong bonds with the people you work with and a strong responsibility to do what you say you're going to do no matter what. So I don't know how many times I worked with a bad cold or sick or whatever, but I just plowed right through it. Now, it doesn't sound like much then, but if you're in the film business and they depend on you and you're the main person or you're doing a specific makeup that has your hand in it, you need to show up and get, her, get it done. So those were all little tools that helped me be prepared for you know, a life as a makeup artist. And I started studying makeup probably just a few months on the road. We were in New York and I picked up a makeup book and then I started practicing makeup on myself. I was doing like stretch and stipple and blowing beards on my face and doing werewolf makeups. And then I got a copy of Dick Smith's little monster makeup magazine while I was in California and started doing what I call kitchen makeup, you know, mixing stuff from the kitchen that you could <laughs> improvise with. And, um, then my friend, the, the instructor who had moved away, and by that time, a year had gone by, he was well into the film business. He, he came to visit, and he invited me to, um, he was working on a, a, a soap opera called Days of Our Lives. Mm. And he yeah. invited me over on my day off to sit and watch him do makeup. So I sat there and watched him do a beauty makeup on a couple of women. And he goes, now, go and check with the showgirls and see if they'll let you do their beauty makeup. So I started doing practicing beauty makeup on the showgirls, you know, the lashes and the glitter and all that crap. Mm. Plus I was always practicing with myself. And every time uh, a guest would come on the show, they wanted to be a guest clown. I would make them up, get them dressed, get them into a clown routine with the rest of us. So I really excelled at working with management and doing publicity stuff. And after two years, uh, I even was back teaching at the clown college they offered me to jump over to the other unit as their boss clown when I was 20. Wow. So after two years of apprenticeship, I got promoted to boss clown. That's kind of like first AD of the clowning department. You know, you <laughs> make sure everyone shows up, you make a note who didn't show up on time, you make sure that their routines are timed out. So it's kind of working with management. So at a really young age, I was given a huge responsibility. And I also met my first wife at the clown college. So here I got married. Let's just say I've never been shy about stacking my deck either to make me excel further or to completely crash. You know, I always take bite off a lot more than I'm, that most people would want to choose. You take a new job as a boss clown and get married again, you know, get married for the first time. That's really fun. So we were the husband and wife clown team. We did a lot of publicity stuff. And she wanted to be an actress and I wanted to be a makeup artist. So we said, okay, we're just going to do what we can. Eventually we're going to get out of here and go to California. Well, we did that. Eventually I went in and told them I didn't want to renew my contract. And by then, every time we played California, I'd go and visit a set or got invited to go meet a department head at one of the studios. And so I was kind of laying the groundwork. And after four years of the show, I'd done about everything I could do. Um, especially when my, my salary was about 265 a week for all the bones I could break and all the people I could make. Yeah. Laugh at. <laughs> so we packed it in and we were out here for a few months and eventually we split up, which is amicably. It was, it was fine. She went her way. I went mine. 
and which really freed me up to really focus on my career. So I, I walked, I still had a, a moving truck because my car had been smashed. This is a really great story. You like this one. I, 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 I traded in our old van because by then we had a travel trailer. So I lived on the circus train for two and a half years. Then I pulled a travel trailer. So I was really a vagabond, a real gypsy. And back in Oklahoma, I sold my trailer, sold my truck, got a new little car. We were going to move out. And I decided to come out and get an apartment. So I drove out, found an apartment, parked my car in my friend's place because a lot of ex-clowns end up coming to California to either get into stunt work or acting or whatever. Hmm. And there was an area, we called it Bozo Row. And <laughs> it, happened, it was called Bozo Row because it was in a, a small apartment complex with these little villas. And one of the one of the ex clowns had moved in there. Well, then another apartment came available, so he contacted his friend, and another ex clown moved in. So every time an apartment would come available, an ex clown would move in there. So eventually, he had five or six ex clowns living in his apartment complex. Great parties. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know, yeah, yeah. People would walk on their hands and do pratfalls. It was it was not a California <laughs> party by all means. We, we brought the circus into into California with us. So. <laughs> I parked my car on a hill at Bozo Row and flew home to get all our belongings in a moving truck and move everything out. So on New Year's Day, I remember the New Year's Day, 1979, I get a call and my friend goes, hey, Steve, I called to come down. I go, does it matter? He goes, you know, it's about your car. I go, well, what happened? He goes, well, you know, when you parked it kind of on that hill, and the hill kind of goes up and, you know, Smitty, you know, Smitty, the, Smitty was in the show with you. Yeah, yeah. Well, he had his van parked at the top of the hill <laughs> and someone tried to break into it and they left the break off. And then there was this earthquake <laughs> and the van started to roll down the hill. I go, wait a minute. Is this like, are you kidding me? He goes, no, no, really. So the van started rolling down the hill because as the guy who broke in was chased away by one of our other clown friends, the, the doors were left open and all this stuff is going on. Meanwhile, the, the idle van is just sitting there and the earthquake shakes it. It starts to roll down the hill and my car is about 100 feet down the hill. Well, it didn't hit my car. It hit three other cars and pushed them all into my car. Oh. So it was like a chain reaction. I go, God, that's like a clown gag. What, how could this possibly happen? I go, you can't write better crap than that. <laughs> I love how that escalated. I just assumed. Oh, you just escalated. It rolled into that. No, it was an earthquake. I, I, I'm looking around and go, okay, is this candid camera? Where's the camera? Yeah. So, play, the, play the Benny Hill music over the top. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I go, okay, let me space it. So I, I left art school behind. I joined the circus. I, I took on responsibility. I got a car. I moved. Earthquake comes. I go, well, California better be good because I'm like really <laughs> challenging myself now. But, and I went, I went to, when we, we drove in, so we're driving around in a moving truck. Fortunately, I had found an apartment. So we moved all our stuff in, but I had no car. So I'm just driving the moving truck from one place to the next. You know, I'm trying to talk my way into a studio to meet somebody. And along the way, while we were still in the circus, they'd done some circus specials. And one of the gals who was doing makeup on the host of the, of the circus special, who happened to be, Bruce Jenner. <laughs> ah. When Bruce was Bruce. When Bruce was Bruce. Yeah. Wow. When Bruce was Bruce. And they were doing a special on circus superstars. Well, the makeup artist and I struck up a conversation. I showed her some pictures of some work I'd done. She says, You need to go see the main guy at Walt Disney Studios. He's a friend of mine. So I got his name. And I got a phone number. So I had all these names and numbers in my pocket when I came to California. The head of CBS, the head of NBC. Um, all these places so I'm going around trying to you know get some work driving a moving truck big square box van right <laughs> my car was totaled I had to wait for the insurance to deal with that and we had met a couple uh, when we were with the circus we would we would make friends they had a little kid that we played to and they kept coming back to see us and they we got in contact with hey we moved to California and they said you know what we've got an extra car if you want to borrow it until you get your car fixed you can borrow it. so at least i had a car That's but good. until that happened we're driving this moving truck around so i drive over to walt disney studios 
I park out front and I walk to the front guard gate and I say, I need to speak to Bob Schiffer in the makeup department. I'm, you know, a friend of his sent me over. Okay. So I'm just like bullshitting my way. Through this. <laughs> so I get him on the phone and we're talking. I said, yeah, so-and-so, you know, uh, Lisa said that I should call you and she saw my portfolio. I was like, oh, well, maybe we can arrange a time. He says, well, I'm here now. Okay. So I talked my way in to see, see him that day on the moment so here i walk into disney go up to the little loading dock next to his office and i see this department head of walt disney who'd been there for years bob schiffer so we talk and he sees kind of what i have he's well you're really kind of on the ground level you need to learn more but you do have experience you know making people up and and with other people i said great says you need to go see this guy over across town named tom berman he's got a makeup studio and I'd heard his name before when I went to see the head guy at CBS. So this name keeps popping up. So I hear I just drive up to Tom Berman's studio, knock on the door, walk in and meet, meet his wife at the time. And I walk into the studio and it's like, um, it's like a magic room. You know, there's all these head casts. They were doing, you know, some prosthetics for some show. They had done um, a movie that I had seen called The Devil's Reign, which was Ernest Borgnine's cool melting makeup. So I knew who he was and I knew who Rick Baker was because I read mm. magazine articles about Rick. I knew who Stan Winston was. I read something in, in a makeup that he had done for Roots. So I started meeting a lot of these people, not knowing the details, but then I started, I picked up a book and started reading about makeup artists. So I, and I knew who Dick Smith was from the Corson makeup book. So as who gets into the makeup at that time, you, you lived by looking at the little big man makeup or the Mark Twain makeup that Dick Smith did. Or, you know, at that time, Rick had done incredible shrinking man, uh, no, incredible uh, melting man. But he did the cantina scene from Star Wars. So I knew who the players were to go see. So one by one, I started going by and meeting people and getting a little feedback from them. And I didn't even have a business card up yet. But then I just kept at it. I went to see Rick. I mean, he was still working at his house. He came around back when he heard the doorbell ring barefoot, you know, and said, oh, I'm back here, you know, and he was just working on his gorilla suit for Incredible Shrinking Woman. So he showed me his gorilla suit and there were some masks from Star Wars there. So I was like mesmerized. And he said, well, you don't have a lot to show me, but you need to go away for like a year and sculpt, make molds, learn how to use an airbrush, glue hair on stuff i go got it doing it so i went away got little odd jobs doing some stuff i was a clown waiter for a while at a restaurant it was an <laughs> entertainment restaurant you know i just put a, a light kind of almost like a chaplain-esque makeup you know just and I, I would juggle and play happy birthday in my trumpet and wait tables and do shtick with my i'm still with my ex-wife at the time and I did that until I could, you know, get on my feet. I worked at a silk screen place doing silk screen because I knew that from commercial art school and anything creative. And slowly I got a job at Universal Studios on the tour doing the makeup for the Incredible Hulk. So, hey, full rubber piece, you know, nose, full body makeup, a wig. It was, you know, every day, every day, every day. Then, I, then Tom Berman called me. He said, hey, we can use you for a couple of weeks. So I go in and I'm sweeping floors. And they're doing some molds for Popeye. They were doing the big arms for Popeye. Oh, yeah. And so I just did, you know, I met a makeup artist named Ken Diaz there. And he showed me how to make molds. And I was watching guys sculpt. And I just started playing with stuff. And, and even back in the circus, I was sculpting Planet of the Apes stuff in my little tiny room on the train. So, like I say, I was all in. If I go to do something, I'm all in on it. And I'm pretty fanatical about it. I eat and drink it 24 seven. And I pretty much was self-taught, but once I got into a studio area and started learning and seeing how they do, I, I picked up really quickly. I started getting some odd jobs for people who wanted rubber masks. I started sculpting and making my own stuff. I got little odd jobs on commercials, doing a beat up woman for like, um, TV Guide magazine, they were doing an article. I did beat a lady up. And I, my friend who did the Hulk makeup on the tour um, was you know, a big bodybuilder guy. And he got a part in a slasher movie because in, in the beginning, in the mid-70s, it's all slasher movies out here. Mm. Um, 
that's what you know tom was tom berman was doing a lot of slasher films and you know stan was doing a lot of creative stuff and rick was you know he, he came off you know melting man and then he went in eventually went into you know um werewolf of london and stuff but I'd been getting all these little jobs and gags and doing things. And finally, about a year later, I called Rick up. I go, Rick, okay, I've got a bunch of stuff to show you because you know, I'm so buried right now. I can't, I don't have time to see you, but if you think you're ready, call this number and ask for Rob and tell him I said to come see you. And it was for Rob Botine. And he was doing the howling because Rick had just passed the ball to Rob because John Landis had, had recalled him and said, we're gonna do Werewolf for London. So Rick and Rob were going to do the howling. And so he passed everything over to Rob and Rob dropped by the house. He was on his way to Greg Canham's house to drop off some molds for Greg to make some, run some foam latex. And he came in and I had masks all over my apartment. I was airbrushing in the kitchen. I was making a mold over here. So he literally walked into my little mini lab in my apartment <laughs> and he hired me on the spot. Amazing. And I said, wow. Well, I'm still working at Universal Studios, so I can work five days a week, and but I still got to work my weekends. So I work seven days a week with Rob Boutine, Universal Studios for, for the weekends. And then they started telling us at Universal, well, we're doing this new show and we want you to wear a rubber mask to chase people around. They go, no. I'm a makeup artist. You want me to wear a rubber mask and chase people around, then that's separate. You got to pay me separate for it. I said, no, no, that's part of your new description. I said, no. I knew you. So I gave my two weeks notice. And later on that day, I stumbled running down the stairs wearing that stupid rubber mask that they wanted me to wear until I, my two weeks was up and hurt my knee. So I got workman's comp for two more weekends and worked full time for Rob for about six months. And, you know, still my buddy at Universal was doing the slasher film. He said, hey, come to the set with me. So I go in and I meet the makeup artist who's doing a slit throat on a girl. And he shows me what he's doing. And I kind of help him glue things down. And I watch what he's doing. He said, hey, we're going to do another little slasher film in a couple of weeks. You want to help me? I said, sure. He says, we only shoot for two weeks. They're really fast, fast and quick. So he showed me a lot of stuff. And then I got other jobs doing little things and it just seemed like all these little jobs came my way and then i was taking a you know here's here's another thing i'm going to add something more if my bit my life wasn't busy enough let's add something more on top of it <laughs> so i had you know out here we celebrate president's day it's like on a monday it's always a monday off right so i said mm. i'm going to go to the park and i got my little dog with me and i'm flying a kite in the park and there's a gal riding her bike and she starts she sits down and starts watching me. So we strike up a conversation. And um, she goes, hey, well, you know, my mom's visiting. I'm making dinner tonight. You want to come over and have dinner? I said, sure. I said, I'll leave my dog at home. Okay. So that was my, my current wife. And wow. we started dating and we were married two months later. Two, and wow. I was, I was just starting to work. I just gotten hired to work on Swamp Thing. Yeah, love that at movie. this guy's this guy's house, this guy named Bill Munns had just he'd been doing Swamp Thing, and but he'd hired a lot of people to do a lot of the heavy lifting because, yeah, he knew some stuff, but you know we were making the big molds and running big foam latex stuff, and I was so fortunate to have fallen in line with all these different people I met. Um, I met Fred Phillips, who was you all recognize his name from the original Star Trek film uh, TV series. I met his daughter up at Universal and she gave me his number and I called him, showed him my portfolio and he called me to work doing prosthetics on this movie. So I was getting all this exposure to big union films. And on that film, they were doing all these munchkins with bold caps and little munchkin hair wigs. And that's where I met V Neal, ah. bold caps. And so we struck up a conversation and I was non-union kind of hiding in the corner where my little work area was. And she goes, you know, I've got this big Halloween party I'm getting ready for. You want to help me do it? So I said, sure. So I helped her gather everything up and put this big party together. And we were friends ever since then. And not too long after, you know, my wife and I were married, I started getting more work. I think that taking on more responsibility of getting married. And she was a single mom. So I had instant, instant eight-year-old son. 
and I'm just, my career is just kicking off and I'm doing swamp things. At least I got some income coming in and we got a little house we're renting and it had a two car garage. So I built a studio in the, in the two car garage and I kept getting phone calls. Can you make some teeth? Yeah, I can do that. And a friend of mine, another ex clown had designed <laughs> this makeup. He was a cartoonist and he had drawn this these characters for um, a director who wanted to direct this movie called Slapstick of Another Kind. And the, the two characters in it were going to be these two kind of funny looking childlike aliens from another planet. And they were played by Jerry Lewis and Madeline Kahn. Wow. So he hired me to do all the lab work and the sculpture and to do Jerry's makeup. So I ended up getting hired to do Slapstick you know, I'm just barely, you know, may, maybe a year into my first year of marriage and I'm doing Jerry Lewis. I can't believe it here. I, ex-clown, first big break is I'm doing Jerry Lewis. That's huge. That's Prosthetic. Nuts. Yeah, and, and you're always kind of nervous about stuff like that. But Jerry was the best. He was great. You know, you realize, you know, people who are perfectionists sometimes get a bad rap as being hard to work with. Well, I don't think anyone's harder to work with than some of the people I'd had to work with in the circus. So I was already had a thick skin. Nothing phased me. My boss in the circus was a German tiger trainer who could knock a cigarette out of your mouth from 20 feet with a whip. Oh, forget you know, that. So, so, and he was the guy I had to answer to and had to deal with every day. And I charmed him. I managed to work really good with him and a great working relationship with him. Not only being the youngest boss clown to come in, and who was just like, are you kidding this guy? But I, I won him over and he totally let me be the boss that I was hired to be. And all those, I call them tools in my toolbox that I'd gained since a young age, all just started stacking up. And then I here I'm doing Jerry Lewis. And my daughter is born on the show. I get V. Neal there to do Madeline Kahn's makeup. So we're working in the same little makeup room and Marty Feldman was in the show just an awesome experience. And as soon as that was over, I got something else and then another job and then another job. And then I was starving for six months with nothing going on. So I put my clown makeup on and I was already a member of Screen Actors Guild and I started doing commercials as high stilt walker. So I'm not only trying to do makeup stuff, but I'm still working kind of as a semi actor slash stunt man, circus skill guy doing stuff in the industry. So I knew both sides of the camera and I, I knew straight up performing. I knew in front of the camera, I knew behind the camera. And when the breaks started, started coming, I worked a lot at the Tom Berman studios. It's Star Trek three, Buckaroo Banzai. And by the time those kind of wound down, he was doing these really cool body suits for this movie called Space Hunter, Adventures in the Forbidden Zone is a 3D film and went to Moab, Utah to shoot. Well, he got me lined up to go and do all the makeups that are a special makeup on the show. So, man, I was doing like 23 every day, 23 or 24 people every day, putting gelatin makeups on them, like these diseased people from another planet and doing prosthetics on little people and, and all this really cool stuff, but just, just me. So, and I got wow. really good, really fast. And then they had a really cool old age makeup that they brought in. And I go, oh crap, I gotta do age makeup. So I mixed up some Dick Smith age stipple and did this really cool age makeup on a guy and a full beard and a wig. So I got really good doing hair work. Cause all the old veterans, you always say, hey, how's your makeup? I go, it's good. I do beauty makeup and I can do monsters. I can do this, no, no, no. How's your hair work? Like, can you do beards and stuff? I go, okay. These guys must have done a lot of Westerns when they were young. <laughs> so I, I basically set out to make myself as well-rounded makeup artist as I could. I wanted to be able to do anything and everything. So eventually, time at Tom's, time in these other little labs doing stuff. I even worked for Stan Winston for a few days, just doing some little things. And you know, even Rick had me picking up some supplies for him. So it was kind of in and out of the, the labs. And then all that time with Rob, with Rob Botin, um, taught me a lot and I became so self-driven to teach myself to the next level. I, I learned some mechanical stuff from Rob. I learned some mechanical stuff at Tom Berman's. I opened my own studio 
So I put my shingle out with my name, you know, Steve Laporte Creations on it, and immediately got a got a job doing an age makeup on Gary Busey for a film called The Bear. It was about a famous football coach, and it followed him all the way through college into his older age, like 70. So I'd age Gary Busey, all of that. Well, if you know anything about Gary Busey, he just wants to jump up and play his guitar and party. <laughs> I was going to say, he's a nutter for my <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, it was like keeping up with him was crazy and I almost quit two or three times because the producer would yell at me because Gary was late or wouldn't behave. <laughs> and I was ready to punch this guy out. And my wife kept telling me, just, honey, hang in there. You can do it. You can get through this. You know, she's home. I'm in Atlanta. So she kind of talked me, talked me off the, off the wall and I got through it and was better for it. So, you know, the whole thing of, you know, never give up the ship. The show must go on was there. And it was it's in my blood. So I got through that. And as soon as I came back, I got another job doing a makeup for a stage play um, featuring a, a character who's Babe Ruth on, on, on Broadway. So I designed this makeup for a Babe Ruth character. And no sooner had that finished, I get a call from a friend of mine at CBS. He goes, hey, Steve, he says, do you want to get in the union? I go, uh, yeah. He goes, well, one of the networks is looking for someone um, to bring in to run their makeup lab, and you have to agree to stay for a year, and you'll get in the union, and from what I understand, you can even do your own little jobs at the lab as long as it doesn't interfere with the day-to-day -day workings of your job or get in anyone's way, and I go, well, that's great, so I sublet my studio out for, the, for a few months so because I had to pay for a year for it. So some guy was designing something and he just needed a space. So I just moved my stuff out, let him use it until the rent, the lease was up. And I went to NBC and I started off there, you know, doing the news, doing the tonight show, doing game shows. I used to work on wheel of fortune and, you know, let's make a deal. And then I did a little show called punky Brewster, which was this little kid show, little girl um about her life as an orphan and i did the pilot and they wanted me to, I, I i was so good at working with children from my clown days that they really liked me and you know it was it was a great time to shine and work with kids and all these different people i loved nbc because they taught me how to do quick good professional you know, straight and beauty makeups. And then every time some funny thing would come along, a character nose for Johnny Carson at the time, he would do these characters. I would make noses for him or Punky Brewster needed some kind of a little gag. Well, they saw a, an article in a, in a National Enquirer magazine. I'd done this photo shoot with the little girl from Poltergeist. Remember the little girl? They're here. Oh, yes. Heather, yeah. Heather yeah. O'Rourke. She was only about seven years old. Well, National Enquirer wanted to do a photo spread showing how makeup can age people, but they didn't want just an age makeup like Little Big Man. They wanted it to be done on a child. So they called Tom Berman originally, and he literally was on the phone. He says, I got the guy for you. He handed me the phone. And from that, you know, they only had about $1,500 in their budget. I said, I can do that. So the next thing you know, I'm designing this makeup which I call my little big man makeup was multiple piece appliances on this little tiny face. So I did the makeup on Heather. We did it on a weekend in a photo studio and the photographer was kind enough to give me a full package of slides of the whole process. So I have the whole makeup stage by stage going on. We went out in the street and took pictures on, at bus stops standing next to people, this tiny little old woman. And it was actually pretty cool. Uh, my sculpting wasn't the best, but you know, you get her far enough and, and you use the light, right? It was very, very convincing. So the producer of Punky Brewster saw this and they go, can you do an age show and age all the children on the show? We've got four children who need aging. And I go, yeah, I could do that. So I took life cast of all the kids and um, a full head cast of, of the, the main adult character on it because I had to age him as well. So I engineered this whole show, which was shot live in front of an audience, and I designed the makeup so we could put them on in 30 minutes, like oh, quick change. So yes. I, I did tests on everybody, and we found out, you know, gluing it down the conventional way was really rough on the child's skin. So I used a water-based adhesive that we used to use for uh, making hair products called Gafquat. It's something that Dick Smith 
had come up with, and I used that to glue it on these kids. So it was a water-based, removable, fast makeup, and they were they're painted eyebrows. You know, hair would hide foreheads. I've lost you. Wait a minute. What is that? Can you hear me? Yeah. Hear me. Yeah. Okay. Something popped up. Whatever. <laughs> I'm rambling now. Hope you hope this doesn't go. Hope hope you don't have to edit this out. But as you said, you know, you want to dig down deep. But oh, yeah. all oh, these yeah. little experiences along the way just paved the way for the next thing. So yeah. I did this little Punky Brewster episode and they loved that so much uh, that they wanted me to do other stuff. So I would do other things for them. Well, this was later at my time in NBC, but I hadn't been there for, I hadn't even been there for six months when Tom Berman called me around Christmas, around the holidays. He goes, hey, he said, uh, I can get you your film days you think you can take a leave of absence from NBC? I go, man, I don't know. I have an agreement with him. Um, he goes, well, I'm going to do this movie called Goonies. And I have to redo a makeup uh, that needs to be fine-tuned, but we, get, we have to do it over the Christmas break and do the makeup tests. So when we come back at the new year, we can start filming. And you know, it's for Spielberg, it is for Richard Donner. And we've already, they've already started filming the makeup. It's, filming the makeup but they can only use some wide shots and um you think you can get you know work it out so i went to the department head and he said okay i'll put you on a double shift on the weekend you can do news and game shows and then you have you know monday through friday off to go do the other show so i would it's go to fun. tom berman's five days a week you know for like eight weeks to get through the holidays but then continuing on so i got all my film days and my TV days within the first year that I was at NBC. And they, you know, it was like, God, I, I'm, as you say, I was shitting in high cotton. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I, was all, I was psyched. So I had my film days, had my TV days. All I had to do was get a few more, you know, a few more days in to get my journeyman card and take my final test. So I, was at NBC, had a big production meeting. This was two weeks after my one year anniversary of being at NBC. And they had written the Goonies adventure for Punky Brewster because they knew I'd been away working on Goonies. Uh, okay. Was through all these you know, haunted cave and stuff. And I had just come back from the production meeting and the phone rings in the makeup lab and I, and I, pick, I pick it up and it's Ken Chase calling from Color Purple. And he wanted me to fly to North Carolina. This is on a Friday. He wanted me to fly to North Carolina on a Sunday to be a second on the show. So I had to turn around. I walked into the department heads of the studio. I said, guess what? I go, I just got a phone call I can't turn down. I said, I agreed to be here for, for one year. And it's been one year and two weeks. I'm giving you my notice. I'm on a plane on Sunday. So we just juggled people around. I ran over to the Punky Brewster office and explained this to the producers. And I said, I'll make sure you guys are covered. You know, the guy who helped me with the age show step in my place. So I, I basically replaced myself everywhere I could, packed my bags, and I went to North Carolina. And Monday, I'm on the set doing makeups on Whoopi Goldberg and Danny Glover and Steven Spielberg's directing. And we're doing color purple and i'd done some lab work for ken chase before that's how he knew me so i ended up doing color purple with ken and we came back uh, to la we had about a two-week break and the producers were so good to me they they kept me on salary so i wouldn't get bumped because i was still getting my days in for the union so they followed through and then ken brought me back to do um makeup and prosthetics for golden child with eddie murphy oh. so i was the lab tech and did a bunch of the, the effects and character stuff for for that show then roger rabbit came around and ken had to do a character makeup on christopher lloyd for roger rabbit oh yeah so i did the lab work for that ken went oh, wow. and did that by that time i'm starting to get other calls for other jobs and it's just like man the universe shined on me that's it come out to California, don't know anything when you think you know everything, hustle for about a year, get get married, have a son. Oh, and by the way, get my wife pregnant, have another baby. 
And, <laughs> and the universe is going to throw work at you. So, and that's kind of what happened. And as soon as I was in the union and, and doing union days, then B. Neal calls me. And she goes, you got to help me do this vampire movie. It's going to be really fun. Mm, Greg's going to do all yeah. the makeup on it. And we're going to do some tests first because Greg's trying to get the prosthetics, but I'm sure he's going to get at it. It's called Lost. I go, okay. You know, but then I bought a little house at NBC. As soon as I got a job, I knew I could make some money. I was going to buy a house. So I bought my first house. And that's when houses were, to me, it was expensive. They were cheap then. I'm still in the same house. It's just three times as big. <laughs> but, you know, I, I just... You know, my, my wife was a good luck charm for me. And my son ended up over the years growing up, helped me in the makeup lab and doing stuff. He's a cop in Las Vegas now. And now I'm teaching his daughter, who's 23, how to break into the business. That's in amazing. One, in one way, shape, or form. But within all this comes all those other movies that you'll probably want to ask questions about. Definitely. So, that is I'm out of breath. I bet you are. That is what is one a hell of a story, Steve. Well, so I, I, just, yeah, I'm I asked you. A, a producer from it says you need to write this stuff down. Yes, do definitely. My, my buddy, who was the Hulk guy in the Hulk, yeah. he became a very well-known um, physical trainer, personal trainer. His name is Jake Steinfeld. He created Body by Jake Enterprises, and you know he's excelled at everything. He, he's been a good influence and a good friend of mine for years. We always call each other on our birthdays and get together when we can. So, oh, and I've got a long friendship, you know, Tom Berman and I still stay in touch. Ken Chase and I still stay in touch. I'm working with V now at her makeup school that she's starting out with. So, you know, I, you know, it's great to go to trade shows, you know, Greg and, and, you know, other artists who are around and, you know, as, as some of them slowly fade away and go off and you ever see them again, I still get to have a few conversations with old friends and colleagues. And, um, now I'm just teaching and making cool shit in my makeup lab, and you know, you know, teaching my, my grandkids how to do cool stuff. I love it. But you've you've mentioned V Neil a couple of times there, but obviously in 1989 yeah. you won the Oscar along with V Neil, which for Beetlejuice. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I guess you could say that it's always nice to to have won something, but if you win it at the beginning of your career you've got a high bar you just set for yeah. yourself you, you can't yeah you can't uh you can't do schlep stuff anymore it's almost like you can't show them that you're still learning when you always are learning so i said that you know that kind of raised my sights on always doing the best and constantly improving everything i'm doing so if it comes at the end of your career you struggle and you, you get acknowledged, that's great. But I got acknowledged early in my career and I've always used that as kind of the benchmark, you know, always do the best you can, always, you know, help other people. Um, I got in the Motion Picture Academy soon after that. So I, here I'm on the board choosing the Academy Award. And I wow. just know that, you know, I wanted to be fair for everybody. So I really became involved in, in, the, in the, uh, the choosing process for what's good in a film. And I would play devil's advocate. If I saw something that didn't look right, I would speak up and say, I'm sorry, guys, you know, you're asking us to judge a film on if it's above and beyond what's expected and outstanding achievement. So I held those high standards, you know, at their word. And I kept that same standard of work for what I do and for the people I work with, even if I'm teaching them or they're teaching me. I always, you know, I, I feel that if you're ever going to make a difference in the world, you need to be constantly giving back to people because they're always going to give back to you anyway if you're giving to them. And, you know, I was raised good to always help people and always do for people what you want them to do for you. So I've always made a point to do that. And um, it's, you know, taught me some good lessons and helped me work with a lot of people and really not really have too many difficult times during my career. It was, it went so fast. I can't believe it. I'd be, I got my gold card in the union, which is a 30 year card, like five years ago. So 35 years in the union plus five years of non-union stuff before, you know, it's just like, where did the time go? You know, and, you know, V and I sit around and, and, and joke about stuff. We'll, we'll bring up a movie we worked on 
and the students have to look up the movie because they've never heard of it because they're too young. <laughs> so it's not. It's yeah, and when, you know, when, and when, Rick, when Rick retired, it was like, and then when Tom retired, and all the all the people who mentored me retired, it's like, well, crap. What am I going to do when I retire? You know. <laughs> and uh, so for for three years after I retired, I was like, uh, what's next? You know. Then the pandemic came, and slowly I'm figuring it all out. Thank God I have got a studio in the back. Cause I got, I've gotten into 3D printing now. I'm making cool little makeup cases and stuff. And I'm making stuff for the school. Um, I like teaching because I had a good, I had good teachers. This goes all the way back to those good teachers I told you about. I had good sharing teachers. And I always use that example to do the same thing uh, with people I'm working with. So I like working in an environment where I'm, I'm like a teaching department head. Uh, when I went to do Lost, um, I'd get over there and, you know, it's in Hawaii. Well, I couldn't bring a whole crew with me. So it was me and one other person and I'd hire the local people. Well, I'd worked over there before. And so I, it became like a teaching job for me. So I would show them how to do prosthetics and how to do beards and how to do all this other stuff. And it was probably one of the hardest jobs I ever took because I had to do everything and teach it to everybody and do it, you know, film quality on a TV budget. So again, that was a challenge. And I was pretty much a feature guy. I'd been doing mostly feature films. I was used to, you know, the beginning of a film, the middle of the film, and it's over with. Well, Lost never ended. It just never, never quite ended. Mm -hmm. And they would never tell us beyond two scripts what was going to happen because it was all a big secret, right? So I really had to work fast and quick and efficient. And I was, I was sculpting and making molds in my kitchen and you know, running silicone in the makeup trailer. And silicone was just kind of getting started at that time. And when I finally left Lost and came back, I had to kind of get rebooted and reintroduced to everyone in the business because I'd been gone for so long. I'd be there nine months out of the year and maybe work on a little lab job when I came home, but still had my family time I had to do. And um, so I had a huge versatile career as, as you mentioned you know my you know my list of films is is Insane. varied and long <laughs> yeah, it's and, incredible and I, was, and I did a lot of a lot of cool stuff i just you know some people step in shit i stepped in gold <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, yeah, you, and, you say you know you've been doing this for like 35 40 years how much has technology changed in what you do over those years oh boy has it i mean i remember learning to run the most primitive foam latex there was and then getting exposed to good formulas i remember when rick came back after doing um gorillas in the mist they had found the new foam rubber that was the new thing on the block and learning how to work with that so i became my own technician so i learned working how to run gelatin prosthetics, foam, foam latex prosthetics. I put Universal to cut time and money. They were making prosthetics that have polyurethane foam, which is a self-expanding foam. I learned how to engineer and do molds. I worked with shoulder to shoulder with professional mold makers who taught me things. So I was learning the right way to do things, at least for a limited amount of time. And then I had, my, I had to have, add my own into the pot to make it, something to work for me. So I was always modifying and changing everything. Mm. And that's kind of where the mad scientist comes in. And then the magic comes in and the boy scout stuff comes in. And then the show must go on kind of comes in. So I was constantly in the back of my mind, moved forward by everything I've learned so far. And people always kid me that, you know, I'm kind of a mad scientist and a traitor. <laughs> Someone hands me a prosthetic and I'll spend 10 minutes kind of changing it around to make it my version of that prosthetic. So they're always, you know, you're, you're just MacGyvering everything you do. And then I got into, you know, blood gags, you know, squirting blood and air bladders and all that kind of stuff, highly influenced by Dick Smith. Uh, when I was away doing that Gary Busey film, um, I got, I called Dick a couple of times and he called me and said, hey, I'm going to do this makeup course. Would you be interested in doing it? I go, well, yeah, where do I send my check? So I just sent him the money. He sent me this big old stack of literature. So I started using that as like my go-to Bible on information. Well, that plus what I learned, plus exposure to other people, I just became, my, my head came full of all this stuff. 
and I have really good recall. I, I don't I don't know if you'd say I have a photographic memory, but I really remember stuff well. I have a, a way of cataloging it that I can bring it up. I was just watching in that two episodes of Lost this morning. I came across it and found it on on a streaming channel and I started looking at it and I'm watching it and it's a scene where they're doing a surgery and I go, oh, that's the day when this happened and that happened. <laughs> I, I, I equate everything I see. I know exactly what was happening on that day. I go, oh, that's where I spilled coffee in my shirt. But weird little total recall things of what was going on. And I remember Matthew Fox had gotten a new tattoo on his arm. Because and I'm oh that's a scene where I said you got to hide your arm because I couldn't cover it because it was a new tattoo. Oh yeah. And I remember that day I said oh that's the that's the scene where he's he's hiding the tattoo, and so I I would watch a show and and I could recall what was going on at that time. That's amazing. That's and nuts. Yeah, it's 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 nuts. I mean I'll watch Lost Boys or I'll watch Beetlejuice for example. And I'll be sitting there and goes, oh yeah, I'm hiding right behind the door because I was powdering the actress as she was standing there and I'm like, what's going on? You know, I'm, or, and sometimes I'll see a hand in the, in the howling. I'll see the, the people in a car and a world on the roof and a hand reaches through the roof. I go, that's my arm. Yeah, so I, no that's way. amazing. So this is, I have a picture of me sitting in a, in a chair in a werewolf suit from here down with an arm. And I was the werewolf on the roof of the car reaching in trying to you know, get Dee Wallace and Dennis Dugan out of the car. And people took a couple of pictures. So I've got a picture leaning on the car and Joe Dante telling me what to do. And I remember Rob telling me, he goes, hey, next time you get up there, instead of pounding on the thing, I want you to peel that sunroof back. So it was a brand new car. So I banged on it and I actually grabbed the sun. I, I folded it back and they had to <laughs> I the car. But it looked great. It was really good. That was the best thing you could have done. So, so my acting got to come into play. I've doubled, I don't know how many actors I've had to double just because I was the makeup guy there and I could deal with it better than the actor could. There's a scene Michael J. Fox in Teen Wolf. And we, he's, in the, he's in the bathroom. And his, dad, his dad's knocking on the door and says, what you doing in there, son? He goes, uh, nothing, dad. And he's turning into a werewolf. And at one point he holds his hands up in front of him and he's looking at his hands and it's his point of view looking at his hands. Well, that's an insert shot and they're my hands. Amazing. So my hands are twice the size of Michael's, but with no reference, it just, you know, we were shooting some scenes, some pickup shots at the Berman studio because Tom had done the makeup for the show. And those are my hands. And then there are scenes of uh, Jeff Bridges in a movie I did with Jeff called Blown Away where he's reaching under the dash, trying to fiddle with some wires. And those are my hands. And I'm lost. I'm changing the radio on a couple of scenes. Those are my hands. So I keep getting in shows and the howling. I'm a dead guy in the background. You know, so I, you know, my, my theatrics do pay off and I have a lot of fun with that, that as well. But it's the most a... on camera scene hands in Hollywood. <laughs> I've had to shave the hair off my hands a lot of times because my hands were too hairy. <laughs> <laughs> but with, with the jobs you get and like the prosthetics you're asked to do like how often do you get something and you're just like how the hell am i going to do this oh like, yeah because some of the things i've seen on your website like how yeah how <laughs> you know re recalling how i saw someone else do something that was similar and mm. also i call it thinking like a magician um and in the circus you create live performance gags for the audience so for example we learn how to work with explosives we you learn to work with monofilament for for hiding things how to carve foam rubber you fold it wrong side out and it becomes a, a big square but you flip it and it's an animal or something so it's the way you think about things it's not how you do it it's the way you um reverse engineer something i'm mm. really good at that and from building model kits as a kid, I can look at something, at all the elements, and, and in my mind, I can look at something and explode it and look at all the different elements singularly and then see how they're going to come together. Um, I'm real good at putting together stuff from Ikea without instructions. <laughs> I can lay all that crap out and go, okay, I'll look at the picture once and I know where everything goes. That's mental. So no, one just, my, do that, my, no one could do that, Steve. No one could do that. Come on. It works that way. Well, <laughs> I, I fool myself some. 
but you know, it is, it is good. You know, I can, I can call, I can call Tom Berman and say, Hey Tom, how would I do this? Or I could call Dick Smith and Hey, how would I do that? But you do that enough times and you develop your own knack for it. And eventually people are calling you and saying, Hey, how would I do this? So slowly I became the guy who got the phone calls. Amazing. And, you know, and, and early on, I, I guess because I kind of came out here having not really been, you know, no family in the business. I broke, I broke down that glass door and got through and got in the business. Somehow my name popped up. And I remember my dad, my dad was a truck driver. He used to drive from Oklahoma to California. And he used to stop in little restaurants and truck stops along the way. And he was in Northern California one year and he had my business card. And he's at this little diner store and this kid goes walking by and he's carrying a monster mask on a headstand. And he goes, hey, what you doing there? He goes, oh, I made this mask. He goes, oh, says, my son's a, a makeup guy in Hollywood. And he goes, oh, really? He goes, yes, if you're ever down there, here, here's his card, call him and, and, and go meet him. And he said, what's your name? He goes, my name is Steve Wang. I know that name. And Steve took my card. You know who Steve Wang is? The name sounds really familiar. Steve Wang, Matt Rose. Steve Wang was Stan Winston's head sculptor for a long time. Steve created the, the Gill Man for Monster Squad. He was one of the lead sculptors on The Predator. He's got his own company. He created the MacGyver character, which is based on, wow. on a, a Japanese hell. story. Yeah. Steve Wang is in and of himself a huge artistic um, influence on this business. Matt That's Rose was, was Rick Baker's main sculptor for years. All those beautiful things that were sculpted for the 90 Perfect stuff. Those guys stayed in the lab, but I remember coming home one day with my wife and there's three guys sitting on my steps and it's Steve Wang, Matt Rose and a guy named Mark Williams. And they had come down from Northern California. They had won a contest in Fangoria Magazine for the best monster. And they just wanted to know how to get in the business. And just on my dad giving Steve a card, I sat down and said, well, here's how I did it. You know, I could, you know, I was a clown and I did this. And I said, but you have to move to Hollywood. And those guys packed, went home, packed all their crap and came back and they did nothing but work since then. Um, Mark Williams oh, has since passed away and Matt Rose passed away not too many years ago, but Steve Wang has his own studio. He's doing his own thing. And all I did was offer advice to, to those guys. And they took the advice that pretty much I followed myself and went for it. And, you know, never say, oh, say I can do that. I'll find out how to do it when a director asks you and learning how to collaborate with people and work with special effects guys and stuff. So, you know, I was a sponge. Like I say, I would, you know, I love the way sets are painted. I'll, I'll ask the standby painter how to age things and, and paint marble on a flat piece of wood to make it look like marble. So all those things interest me. So set design, costume, all that stuff. So I'm not just like your average makeup dude. I, I, I'm, I'm a, as one director called me, he says, you're a filmmaker. You're not a makeup artist. Because he That's asked amazing. me that question. He said, are you a filmmaker or a makeup artist? I said, I'm a filmmaker. And he goes, that's what I wanted to hear. And that's, that's followed awesome. me. That's, that's been a great way to think about it all my career. And, you know, after all those years in film and then doing Lost for nine, uh, six years and then doing other film stuff and then getting back into features and then doing television stuff, um, I finished out with a huge career and a big old fat resume full of really cool and creative things. I got my bucket list. I did my Star Wars stuff. I did my vampire stuff. I did my old age stuff. I did my Western. I did my war movie. I did my hospital show. I pretty much, I worked with some really cool, famous old movie stars. Um, I was Jack Lemmon's makeup artist for three of his last films kind of like working with my dad and it was just a basic makeup but i did do stunt double masks for for stunt doubles and stuff so i got to work with everybody and i've made up some really cool famous people and, and a lot of people before they were famous so it's been a great ride and like you say how do you do that stuff it just comes to you and you wing it sometimes you just have to wing it and commit to it and this never give up 
you've been part of some pure classic movies, like cult classic movies, like The Lost Boys, like Beetlejuice, like Terminator yeah. 2 as well, like one of the greatest yeah, the, sequels ever. Right. If after not B, we, yeah. And after we, after we got the Oscar for Beetlejuice, I thought, you know, maybe I should open up a lab again because I could parlay this into getting more work. So I opened up a studio and, you know, because I got offered a, a big lab job. So I just opened a studio up, hired some people. And for two years that ran, but then Jeff Don called me out of nowhere and said, Hey, Steve, um, I'm going to do another Terminator film. Uh, you want to do it with me? I go, well, crap. You know, I got the lab going and the job was just finishing that I was on. I said, sure. So I, I, again, I sublet my shop out for the boys who were doing another Star Trek film. They used my shop. They hired a couple of the ladies who were helping me out to keep an eye on my stuff and help them with their stuff. And I went away and did Terminator, and that was a oh. six-month gig. And you know, because I'd worked with Jeff before, I'd, I'd helped him on um, what else? Uh, um, Running Man. Oh yeah, I did Running Man with Jeff, um, and we he and I actually got in the, the union at the same time, and took our test together. So we were friends back in those days, and I'd helped him on a couple of other little jobs. But when Running Man came along, he had promised. Uh, the job to someone else but they were finishing up on another film so I came in and did like the first month of the film which was really the meat of the prosthetic and, and makeup gags on the show so that's where I met Arnold so you know he wants to you know, when you're on a, on a show with big names you want to surround them with people that are trustworthy they're not there to like mm. rub elbows with the actor and you know, try to steal them away and become their client. You don't want to, you know, that's something that you learn quickly. It's a very small business and you can burn your, your whole career by being a little over presentation of yourself to actors and you know, here's my card. You know? Oh my God, yeah. oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> and, uh, and I'd never looked favorable on that. And um, so Jeff wanted to bring someone in who felt comfortable with and who Arnold felt comfortable with. So immediately, you know, Terminator 2 was an easy thing. And I, I knew Stan already. Um, so it was, a, it was a really good fit. I ended up doing Linda Hamilton's makeup and um, doing the makeup with Jeff and I would double up on Arnold every day to get him out of the chair quick. And then I would do the stunt doubles. And then uh, we brought another couple makeup artists in to help with some of our other characters. But I would prep the pieces every day and make sure everything was ready for the next day's work. And then go on set. I take care of Linda. And then, you know, that, that show was a really great feather in my cap. I mean, who knew it was going to be as big as it was? And it was huge. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. And then we did Terminator 3 um, years later. And I always called it Terminator Light because, you know, <laughs> because Jim Cameron wasn't there. It wasn't, you know, yes. an ominous present. Jim is, he's a gifted director, but he can really be rough on people. You know, he can really, he expects 101%. Which again is is good because it really teaches you, you know, don't bullshit your director. You know, if you say you can do something, do it. If you can't do it, find out how to do it. And that's kind of how Jim works. So working with Jim was a really great opportunity. So when we did Terminator 3, of course, the technology had changed. You know, we went from foam latex pieces to um, gelatin pieces. We used gelatin on Terminator 3. And then, of course, the silicone heads that they were using and the mechanical pieces. So Terminator 3, although it wasn't acknowledged as, you know, from, a, from the Academy for its makeup, I feel the makeups were much better on Terminator 3 than Terminator 2. But, you know, the Academy views something as it's either more of the same or something new and original. Well, to them, they viewed it as more of the same, which is fine with me. It's just nice to work on films that are, are fun and enjoyable and again it was being reunited with arnold and before that i'd come in and worked on um end of days a little bit and picked up pick oh, up shots film. on greatest it was a great america what was it? a couple other films arnold did um end of days was shot anyway i'd come in and do a few days and cover arnold for jeff while he went to do and start another show so I spent a lot of time with Arnold and Jeff working on shows. And back even when I was doing Lost, um, I needed someone to pick up and finish the last part of the last season with me. And Jeff was available. So he came in and he and I both 
did the last part of the season of loss. And, and Jeff is a really good department head. He developed a system using walkie talkies to intercommunicate within the department and with the ADs. So I picked that up on him on, on Terminator 2 and have carried that, that ability uh, to communicate with everyone around you um, as part of the way I work. So I come into a show and I say, okay, I need four walkie talkies, boom, boom, boom. And in the, the 80s go, why? We knock on the door and tell you when the actor's ready. He says, no, you won't. I'll tell you when they're ready as they step out of the trailer and you'll save yourself. I like it. So, so I really changed the way I work based on what I learned from Jeff and from other productions. So I, be, I create a really efficient department and one that was fun to work with. You know, my entertainment training in the back is always, it just comes to the forefront. So I have a good time when I work and people who work with me have a good time. And you notice I say the people work with me, not for me, work for me. People work with me, no matter how mm. young or inexperienced they are. And that's the point of view that I always carry around with me. And it's infectious. And I think it teaches them to do the same thing when they move on to other stuff. Love that. No, it's, it's that psychology. It's that you know you have to not only be a makeup artist, you have to be a psychologist and a bit of a, a psychiatrist <laughs> to get people. I've had to talk actors down who are all wound up. You know, first thing of the day, and they'd had an argument with their wife or their kid. Their kid was crying when they left. You know, home to go to work, and you know, you share. You know, and you just become a good shoulder and a good listener, and maybe a good advice giver. Um, so you develop, you develop a good working relationship with your actors and it carries on. And that's how you get the phone call. Hey, I want you to do my next job with me. You know, um, so, you know Josh Holloway from Lost who played Sawyer. Uh, uh, you know, he's called me several times to do shows with him. I've done a couple of, of other TV series with him. So, you know, it's, it's great to have the respect of the actors you work with and the respect of the people who come through your trailer other artists and stuff yeah and and you know it just rubs off i i I have had such a great great time and at one point in your career you don't want to be that old timer who's coming around looking for work i knew that i didn't want to be that guy who the phone stopped ringing and he's hoping he can hang on to some of that glory you know that he used to have and i said you know what I'm going to go out at the top of my game and I'll work when I want to work. I'll teach people who want to learn and create a new chapter while I'm still old enough to do something. So I retired when I was 62. Um, fortunately, uh, pandemic gave me some good time off to really focus on what I wanted to do next. So I'm just going to you know, teach those in my family who want to learn and teach students who want to learn and make cool stuff in my lab and, and develop some products and just really have a good time. And if I don't want to do it, I don't do it. Don't I have to. a pension and social security that can keep me going. And, and my wife gets a social security. And fortunately we bought our house, you know, almost 40 years ago. So, you know, we live in a nice big expensive house that didn't cost us a ton to live in. So we can stay, stay put. That's good. That's amazing. And, you know, and the family comes over. It's, it's empty nest now. We have a big old house with no one in it but us two. But you know, my daughter lives up the street. You know, with the baby, and my son-in-law is close. And my son comes in from Vegas, and now my my granddaughter's moved in with my daughter. So we're slowly getting this family unit back together. Amazing. So the Laporte house will be just one big creative fun. <laughs> <laughs> no. and, and, and and my producer says you got to write a book. Yes, yes, you do. Yeah, yes, yes. Go, well, yeah. Which book? The one on the on the bus to Florida from Oklahoma, <laughs> or the one in the circus, or the one getting a job from the circus in the it's film all industry? Of anthology series. Yeah, there you or, go. or how to do this kind of makeup <laughs> book? And and then when I saw Rick Baker's double volume book, it's very intimidating. Well, crap, I don't have anything like that to offer, <laughs> but I do have a I do have a fun, cool story, and I am enthusiastic about what I do. And um, I'm good at teaching. I think I'm good at, at making that human contact with people. And um, it's just, I, I kind of found a new chapter. And yeah. the bottom line is going to have fun when I'm doing it. 
Well, so. Steve, I've just noticed the time. Like, so we'll start wrapping up in a minute. But I, I okay. did want to say, like, looking at your resume of all the stuff you've done, you know, you've you've helped create memories for so many people some of these projects. But but there's one of them that stood out to me the most on a personal level. Because when I was like two years old, my mom has memories of this. I would run up and down her, our sofa with a little plastic guitar, jumping off, watching music videos by a certain oh. man named Mr. David Lee David Roth. David Lee Roth. And you did the fat suit on the going crazy music video. Yeah. And I was just like, oh my God, this is amazing. It brought back so many memories you know, for me. That was, that. Yeah, and that was, that was really funny because a, an ex circus clown who turned assistant director was got a job producing a film for CBS called Crazy from the Heat. Yeah. And David had just left Van Halen and they were going to do a movie. Well, you know, Dave's a funny guy. You know, he he hired a couple of little people to be um, I guess security guys for him. <laughs> and I guess, you know, I'm going to use an improper word here, but it's not nothing like having a scary midget being your head of your security team, right? <laughs> Well, one of those guys, both two guys were ex-circus clown friends of mine. And oh, then wow. here's my ex, ex other clown who's a producer. So they called me and said, hey, I'm doing this. We're doing the show with Dave Lee Roth. He needs a fat makeup. So I go in, I meet Dave and he's just an average great guy. And we start talking about it. And I said, OK, I need to do a full face of you and arms and all this stuff. <laughs> and he came over to the Berman studio, which was close by. And I took all my casts and did all the stuff for it. And everything was sculpted. In the meantime, I'd gotten my job at NBC. So this is all this in-between stuff happening. And then they called me back and they go, Steve, the movie got canceled. I go, crap, what am I gonna do? We, we did the makeup test already. I did this really cool makeup test on Dave at his office. And my son came along and I borrowed a video camera. So I have the video of the first makeup test somewhere. Wow. Hopefully it's not degraded, but I still have to pull it out. That's another thing I have to do is pull out all these videos and, and movies out of stuff. But we were gonna do this really cool makeup on Dave and it was gonna be his own hair. He was gonna be dressed as King Neptune coming up out of the ocean. So I designed a full naked <laughs> bodysuit with a mermaid tail a fishnet tank top, you know, his little gloves with the fingers out and stuff. And I thought, okay, this is going to be cool. What I need, I'll send you, I'll take a picture of the original design for that as King Neptune and send it to you. Oh my you'll God, get a, please do. You'll be a hoot to see what it originally was going to be. So meanwhile, I'm visiting my family in Oklahoma. I'm there for a wedding. And I get a call and it's Dave and he said, hey, Steve, we're going to do a music video. But the concept has changed. Um, you don't have to do a full suit. Uh, we'll get Ward costume department's going to make a fat suit for me. We just need to use the arms and the face. And but we need a pompadour hairstyle, you know, silver pompadour, because I'm going to do it with my my partner. We're going to do the the uh, what was it called? The two um, fabulous Picasso brothers. Picasso Something brothers. Like, yes. So. So his partner was the other character. And so then we started putting this together. Meanwhile, I had to fly back. We shot the video in two days. The first time I put the makeup on since the test six months before was the first day it works. Wow. And, and I'm using new techniques and painting it to get it ready. We put them all together. My friend hairstylist came in and helped, helped me build the wig right on Dave. And he, she sewed two wigs together and got it working for me. And I tidied it all up and got it going. And we shot that for two days. Um, and, but Dave was just a blast to work with. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it, it, it was so much fun. And when we go back, I'm not going to tell certain things, but let's just say he gave me a good going away present to keep me up and awake and happy <laughs> all the way home. <laughs> Something that requires a cigarette lighter. <laughs> and it wasn't a candle. So he goes, hey, this will keep you up because I know you got an early plane to catch. So, but, uh, so we, we, kept, we kept in touch. He even called me back later to do a mask for, that was on the front of his album called Eat Him and Smile. It was a yes. witch doctor mask. Yeah, I know the one. So I, 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 I took, that. Yeah, I did a vacuum form of it and put a hinge jaw on it 
and painted the makeup on the clear vacuum form mask and did all the feathers in it. So all he had to do is run off stage and throw that mask on and he would be in that character that was in the front of the album. Because that's so in a music I, video as well. So I, oh, that's amazing. Oh, well, that one was the, the full makeup, I think. But anyway, it, it kind of reunited me with Dave again. And I haven't seen him since then. He's been off doing his thing. It's really fun to work. I have, I have these crossroads. I meet all these different people. And you know, from doing that video with Dave, a producer on that video called me for another one. So I ended up working with Jeff Stein, a, a director who also had done the famous Cars video where Rick Ocasek is the fly, you might think. I think he's a fly and he's flying around and it's Rick Ocasek's head on a fly. <laughs> Well, he was going to do a video with Huey Lewis in the news, and it was all Frankenstein's castle. And it was for a song called Doing It All For My Baby. So I flew up to Marin County, did a full cast of Huey Lewis and the bass player, and came back and did Huey Lewis as Frankenstein's monster. That's and awesome. also did Huey as the mad, the crazy mad scientist doctor. And we shot that over a period of a couple of days. And it's a long video. And I made up every guy in the band either with a bald cap as a two-headed guy or Igor or, you know, all these characters. So I ended up doing all these really fun, creative videos. So I did that with, after, after Dave's video, I did Huey Lewis. Then I got a call to do Huey again on a couple of straight makeup gigs. I ended up doing four videos for Huey Lewis in the news. Then I got a call uh, while I had my second studio to do something for a group called Warrant. And they yeah. did a song called Cherry Pie. <gasps> so I did the face for Janie Lane for Cherry Pie. Oh, of course. The yeah, big, he has a big, big smile. The big smile face. So Janie comes into the shop, and I didn't know who he was. My son, being of the right age, goes, hey, he's with you know? So he got to come, and he helped me put the makeup on. So I got some cool pictures of my son. He's like a teenager. helped me do Janie's makeup. And then from that, the same director called me again to do another video for the Cars. And I did their very last music video called You Are the Girl. And they're in outer space, they're on a spaceship and they dock with this other spaceship and all these alien women are in the, in the video. So I ended up doing all these cool creative videos within about a three year period. That's awesome. And, and then I got called from the same director to do a, a project with Shelley Duvall called Mother Goose Rock and Rhyme. And it was taking all these famous musicians and, and singers and you know stuff in the music business and turning them into fairy tale characters. So I did, um, God, what did I do? Shoot. Oh, Howie Mandel was Humpty Dumpty. I saw pictures of that. It's absolutely terrifying. Yes. And, and so, <laughs> and, and then, uh, let's see, who else? Woody Harrelson was Lou the Lamb and Cindy Lauper was Little Bo Peep. And, uh, <laughs> ZZ Top was the, were the three men in the tub. So it was all these cool <laughs> fantasy characters. So I, that was a time when I had my studio going. I was doing all these great characters. And it was a good time because it kind of dried up in film work, but then it kept me busy. So again, the universe was shining on me and kept me going. And then I didn't do oh, hardly any, any videos after that at all. It's just a small window of time. But I think you know, going crazy was a blast. And I got some really cool pictures from it. I went to the, to the office and got some really nice shots of me and Dave goofing around on the sofa, holding a bunch of money. And I'll send you, I'll send you some of these pictures. You'll oh, please do that. Oh, that sounds amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. So, but I'm glad you'd like that one. Oh, I love it. It holds a real special memory to me when I was a kid. So that's why I want to ask about. But as, I, as I've and said, you, you know. You got me an interview with, they got me an interview with Warren Beatty for Dick Tracy, but ended up uh, that John Caglione did Dick Tracy, but at the same time I was doing the Howard Mandel big egg makeup as he was doing Little Face. So incredible, incredible. Tom, have you got any more questions before we wrap up from our friend here? Just one more, really. Did you ever think yeah. growing up when you were doing all your clown college learning, all your skills, doing pretty much everything under the sun, that this is where your life would end up today? Did you ever think you would I, do all these I, I did Well, I, I, I did set goals. I, when I heard about becoming a makeup artist, I said, that's what I'm going to do. So I got books and I learned and I taught myself and I did anything I could to learn. 
then when I got out here and found I didn't know much and Rick said, you need to go away for a year. I focused on it and I did it. And I want, like I said, I wanted to be an all, I wanted to work all the time. I didn't just want to get a phone call to put on a rubber nose. I wanted to work all the time. So I made, yeah. made sure I was a well-rounded makeup artist. So I could do beauty, character, you know, blood gags, effects gags, puppets, uh, all that stuff. I created a character for a movie called Ice Pirates called the Space Herpy. <laughs> There's a little puppet creature that, you know, scared people, yeah. little miniatures. And that's because an actor heard my name and he came to me and wanted me to make him up in a disguise so he could get a job on that movie and fool the director because the director knew him and he didn't want the director knowing it was him and influencing the director's choice. So I put a disguise makeup on him. He got the job and the director said, who did your makeup? And he gave my name and the director called me in, saw my portfolio and hired me to make this creature for him. Oh, so mad. that's That's awesome. Everything led to the next job, and he's on. He's the, actually the space herpes on the poster of the movie. There's a little character says space herpy, and it's my little creature up there. <laughs> and it wasn't to me; it was just a little single silly thing. But you know, I'm a much better artist now than I was then. Had I only known, <laughs> but you know, all those things paid off and gave me a full rounded career. And now it's just I just take it as it comes comes to me. You know, it's a really creative place to be. And I love nothing more than working on large crews with creative people around me and stuff. Um, Grinch was a really fun show to work on because, you know, Rick brought me in for that. And there's nothing like being in a soundstage of, you know, 40 makeup artists and 40 hairstylists doing people from Whoville. <laughs> yeah, that a wonderful, a wonderful atmosphere. So those things really are the ones I really, I really enjoy and have great memories. But uh, you know, it's just been Absolutely, a great, man. been a great run, and it's still Incredible. going. It's amazing. I'll write like that book someday. Yeah, <laughs> yes, please do, Steve. Uh, this has been so much fun. But I feel like we've barely touched on your career. I would love to have you back at some yeah. point and go talk yeah. about some of these movies in a bit more detail. It'd be amazing. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. I'm going, and I have a, I have a YouTube um, handle called the Makeup MacGyver which just has a few videos on it, but eventually I'm going to start doing, you know, how to do stuff. And my granddaughter says, you know what? You should do something called, so you want to make that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and just, you know, whether, no matter if, even if it's not makeup related, just show them how to make cool stuff. That's so, a great idea. That's working a great on idea. that. Yeah. So uh, I, uh. I like, I like that idea. So more on that later. We'll see how that develops. Now that I've mentioned it, I've put my foot out there. I'm going to see if I have to follow up on it. Yeah, absolutely. We'll be watching that part. Don't you worry. Absolutely. Here's the rubber heads I'm making for the makeup school, you know, for, for doing beards and stuff. But this Incredible. kind of stuff is what I like doing. Yeah. It's face maker. That's my handle. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Love it. That's amazing. That's the commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, before we let you go, have you got any yeah. plugs, any websites, social medias you want people to go check out and you follow? Know, one? If anyone wants to follow me, um, you can go to facemaker.com. It's an old website. It really needs to be uh, rebooted and redone, but that's the best place to find me in portacase.com. Right now, it's all linked to one. It's probably a broken website, but as I have the time now, it'll, it's going to get updated. My granddaughter's helping me a lot with this stuff. Amazing. She's 23. She's going to help me get back into social media more because I want to just make cool stuff and make it available to people. And I'm going to start making some really fun videos. So you can, if you just Google Steve Laporte face maker, you'll find a ton of stuff and you'll follow it to the right place. And eventually, I, I don't know when this is going to air, um, but Hopefully I'll get more, more stuff changed and added to that. I haven't built a website in years, but it's time to go back to it because it's gotten so much easier. This is yeah. coming out on April 8th, just to let you know. Okay, great. So I'll go. try to even have more stuff in place by then. Amazing. Beautiful. Steve, you're a true inspiration, sir. This has been thanks. wonderful. I've really thoroughly enjoyed sitting here and listening to your stories. Well, thanks. And like Jamie said, we're definitely happy back on because we barely even touched the surface of everything yeah. that you've been involved in and done. So it'd be great to hear more stories again. So we're definitely awesome. happy back on. It'd be great. Thanks, guys. So great talking on. to you. Stay in touch. I'll shoot you a couple of pictures of the day yes. that we lost thing. Please do, because that'd be and amazing. Those, <laughs> those were the days before Photoshop. We used to take a piece of acetate and oil paint on top of the picture. So that's what I did. It's, it's an oil no painting way. on top. 
over the photograph with just acetate. So that's old, amazing. really old school. It's up there somewhere. And you'll know it's King David because he's got a crown on his head. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's incredible. Have an absolutely wonderful rest of day. So enjoy it. Thanks, Look after man. yourself. Take care. And we'll speak to you soon. Awesome. Indeed. Take care. Thank you, sir. Take care, sir. Yeah. See you later, man. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Hey, Jamie. Do you like being cosy? I do. And do you like staying cosy? I like that even more. Then just head over to www.staycosyclothing.com where you can find hoodies, tees, sweaters, and much, much more. And just enter The Chronicles as one word at checkout to receive 10% off your order. And make sure you follow them on the Instagram at Stay Cozy Clothing to keep up to date with all the new designs. Remember, guys, that's The Chronicles as one word at checkout to receive 10% off your order. And now back to this week's episode. What an incredible conversation. I love that one so much. That is great. Top the tier. Your face, the way your face lights up. Well, it's about David Lee Roth is insane. You're literally like, this is the greatest thing ever. But seriously, when I was two, like from the age of two, I was watching that music video. Like, so to know that he worked on that and then the stories he told about it, just amazing. Oh, Steve, it's I need amazing. to get those pictures off you, sir. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we will We will chase. We will chase and we'll get them so then we can show them for the world to see. Because, yeah. Just that we all hope that you guys enjoyed listening to it as much as we did recording it. Steve, thank you so much again. We really appreciate your time, sir. And we'll have you back on again soon. Damn right. Hey there. I'm Frank Guglielmelli, and I'm the narrator for the audio drama feed. Featuring such audio dramas as Bounty Hunters, Marty and Mars, Val, Toby, and so much more. You can find all of these wonderful programs on Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. Or you can go to our website at www.audiodramafeed.com. We are thrilled to be affiliated with the Chronicles of Podcast with Tom and Jamie.